And I would like to ask you now to turn in your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter number 1. The book of Luke, chapter number 1. We're going to read four verses, and I'm going to read these verses, and then I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to make a statement, and then we're going to pray. Luke chapter number one, if you're new to your Bible, just turn to the table of contents. It's in the New Testament. It's the third book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, then Luke. As you're turning there, if you can pull out a copy of your sermon notes, you'll be taking notes today. Everybody should be taking notes. There's a pen in the chair in front of you or behind you. I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, homework as well and uh, try to help you as a Bible student Uh, so that you might grow in the Word of God. Luke chapter number 1, are you all there? All right, let's begin in verse 1. It says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. How many of you understand what was just read? Raise your hand and say, I need some clarity on that. Yeah, yeah. And so today, by the time I get done preaching on these four verses, it will be crystal clear in your understanding what those four verses were. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the holy word of God. I pray that you would open the word of God to us. As I expound, I pray it wouldn't just be me expounding the word of truth, but it'd be the Holy Spirit of God giving understanding, giving context, giving cross-references, giving every insight and application that needs to be made so that we can grow as lovers of God. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen Amen. and amen. So this book of Luke is written by Luke. He's a Gentile physician, a doctor, if you would, that takes copious notes, and he was a travel companion of the Apostle Paul. And the book of Luke and the book of Acts go hand in hand. They're together. If you look who it's addressed to, it's addressed to Theophilus. Both in the beginning chapter of Luke and in the beginning chapter of the book of Acts, it says it's written to Theophilus. Theophilus means lover of God, friend of God. He was a man in the Roman government, a high-ranking official, perhaps a disciple, if you would, of Luke. And he's writing in order that his disciple would have good, clear understanding of the account and ministry of Jesus Christ. Not only of the life of Jesus Christ, but in the book of Acts, what happened after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so these four verses, we're going to see many, many things, and we're going to grow in understanding. If you're taking notes, and I highly encourage every one of you to take notes, writing down the very first point, number one, the declaration of Christ. The declaration of Christ. We see that there's three sources here in verses 1 and 2 in the declaration of Christ. It was declared by first century writers, first century writers. He says in verse 1, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Meaning there were other people that wrote so that you would know about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Matthew wrote about it. We see that Mark wrote about it. We see the Apostle John wrote about it. We see that Peter wrote about it. If you study your Bible, you'll notice that there were many writers that were declaring Jesus Christ. See, this is not just a book of cunningly devised fables. This is a book of the inspiration and power of God about the Son of God. Now, specifically, the Gospel of Mark is about the Son of Man. The hallmark verse of this this whole book is for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. It shows the humanity of Jesus Christ. The physician, Luke, is detailing the account of the life of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ the Messiah. And so he says there were other writers in the first century that were declaring who the Christ was. B, declared by first century believers. Declared by first century believers. Paul declared him. You see, John declared him. Many, many believers, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 14, it said that Jesus Christ, after he died and rose again, it says that he was seen by over 500 people. 
They saw him. He ministered unto them on the road of Emmaus. He said, hey, you're, why are you so sad? I'm alive. We see him showing up to doubting Thomas. And so Luke, the physician, is writing on his own account, and he's taking in order, and he's saying, hey, there was other people that wrote about him. There were other believers that declared him, and then letter C, declared by first century ministers. First century ministers. There were all kinds of ministers. If you read the, uh, the account of the book of Acts, you'll notice that there were many travel companions with Paul. There were many people that did the ministry of Christ. Jesus had the three, the 12, and the 70. If you look in Luke chapter number one, he says, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things, meaning other people have declared in hand, meaning they wrote it down, and he says this, which are most surely believed among us. They're believed among us. These accounts that I'm going to tell you about were believed among us. Verse two, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Who was, a, who was an eyewitness of Jesus Christ? Was Peter? Was James? Was John? They were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They saw him transfigure before them. Was doubting Thomas? Yes. Were all these apostles, they were eyewitnesses. So here, you want to think about something? Why would these disciples just die for fairy tales? They wouldn't. This is the authoritative account of Luke who did investigation, painstaking investigation, asking Paul, hey, tell me about how this happened. Hey, Peter, how did this go down? Hey, tell me about the Sermon on the Mount. Were you there at the Sermon on the Mount? And he would have had his pen handy. That's why I highly encourage every single student of the Word of God, always come to church with a pen. Always come to church ready to write notes. Be the kind of person that is diligent and ready to take copious notes to be able to set and order things, not just for yourself, but for others as well so that they can grow in grace as well. See, they were eyewitnesses of the majesty. In fact, the Bible says they took it so serious in 1 Corinthians 4, 1, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. They were, they were stewards. So here's what Luke is saying in the declaration of Christ. Verse number one, he says, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth and order a declaration, meaning other people have taken in hand to declare those things which were most assuredly believed among us. Do you understand verse one now? Say yes or no. Yes. Check. We understand. People wrote it down. So it was declared among us. They took in hand so th about the things that we believe. Verse two, even as they delivered them unto us, they gave it to us. They shared it with us. They, they told us about it. They wrote it down, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses. They saw Jesus and ministers of the word, the gospel. Do you understand verse number two now? Yes. yes now you're beginning to get context. Let me give you point number two in the message. The determination of Luke. The determination of, of Luke, write this down, of Luke, that's in your blank. Here's what he was determined to share with them. He was determined to share with them his experience about Jesus Christ. Now, you think about this. Did Luke travel with Jesus? Did, G, did Luke see everything? No, he didn't see it all. But here's what he did. He investigated. He took copious notes. He would ask Peter, Peter, tell me about what that was like when you were fishing that one day and Jesus came by to you and your brother. And you, how did he say that again? Uh, when he was preaching there over there, when he raised that, that, that person from the dead, who was there? Oh, this guy was there. Let me go find that guy. He would have investigated the whole thing. And it wasn't, listen, it wasn't just for his own experience. It, was only, it wasn't just for his own knowledge. It was so he can capture the information, so he can write it down in a very systematic, organized fashion. If you're taking notes, A, by the Spirit, by the Spirit. Now, you think about the Bible. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Meaning, guys didn't just come together and have a good idea to write it down. The Scripture says this, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Meaning, who put the idea for Luke to pen the Scriptures? The Holy Spirit did. See, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Meaning, the Holy Spirit of God, He gave Luke this insight, a prompting of the Spirit. Hey, go to, you're, you're right here with, with Paul. Ask him all these questions. You're a doctor. You're seeing all the sufferings and you're washing everything. Go find out for, with Peter what took place. Go find out with John and, and Luke, the physician. Here's what Luke did. Luke traveled 
with Paul. Now, if you're Paul, and you've all studied the life of Paul, haven't you? If you haven't, if you're new to your Bible, it's okay. Paul was a warrior. I mean, the guy would step out by faith. The guy was whipped and beaten. He would step up in, 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 a, in situations where idols would be like, you know what? This place is given to idols. Let me tell you about King Jesus. And he would have been preaching. You know, y'all look at all this stuff. Let me, you, 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 got a, you got an idol here to the unknown God? Let me tell you about the unknown God. His name is King Jesus. He would have walked up in synagogues and, 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 and been telling the Jews about who the Messiah is. And do you think he would have got whipped and beaten for that stuff? Oh, yeah, he was whipped and beaten many times. In fact, the Bible says he was in deaths oft. How many of you ever been in deaths oft? Meaning often died. <laughs> he, he was preaching one time. They took him out back and they stoned him. And bam, 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 he was left for dead. The disciples gathered around him. They started praying. And before you know it, the rubble of stones started shaking off him. Before you know it, he said, what are y'all doing? You know, and he, he come right up alive. You, you say, what did he do right after that? He went right back to the people he was preaching to and ministered unto them. Now, you know who was behind, next to him while he was doing a lot of these works? Luke. Who wrote the book of Luke? Luke. Now, let me ask you a question. If you're the Apostle Paul and you're getting yourself into dangerous situations, troublesome environments, turbulence and trouble and all kinds of physical potential problems, who do you want with you? The doctor. <laughs> Bring the doctor, please. You want the doctor with you. You see, Paul would have wanted probably a doctor and somebody to help fund his ministry. Right? You need money and you need healing. You need both to be able to do ministry. Right? Because without money, you're not going to go very far. And without physical capacity, you're not going to go very far. So you need both. And so Luke was with him. In fact, you're taking notes now. And we're, we're, we're under the point, the determination of Luke. He, it was determined by the Spirit to write this and to proclaim this. But it was also letter B by experience painstaking investigation. Luke would have went through some things. Luke would have felt some of the pains that the apostle Paul would have went through when uh, Paul was incarcerated, when Paul was going through things. In fact, I want you to write these down now, okay? I'm going to give you some cross-references. And As Bible students, it's very important that you learn how to study your Bible. Paul wrote about Luke or Lucas in his journeys. And so write in your notes next to experience. I want you to check this out later when you get home. If you're a Bible student and you care to know the Bible, I want you to write this down. Colossians chapter number four, verse 14, Colossians 4, 14. Paul is writing to the church at Colossae and he says, Luke, the beloved physician and Demas greet you. So who's with him? Luke. Luke is with him when he's writing to that church at Colossae. He says in, uh, in Philemon or Philemon, however you want to say it. How many of y'all say Philemon? Raise your hand if you say Philemon. How many of y'all say Philemon? Philemon. How do you say it? Philemon. How many of y'all say Philemon? All right. Well, I don't care how you say it. Just say it, okay? And uh, uh, verse 24. If you're looking for chapter 24, there's not 24 chapters in Philemon or Philemon or however you want to say it. There's only one chapter, okay? It's a small little book. Uh, Paul's writing to, to Philemon or Philemon about Onesimus, right? Over uh, uh, one of the guys that left and he got saved. Possibly. That's another story, okay? But uh, here's what he says in verse 24. He says, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Lucas is with him. So Luke is with Paul on his journeys. Now, right at the end of Paul's ministry, right when he's about to die, Here's what, I want you to write this down. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 10 and 11. 2 Timothy 4, verses 10 and 11. Now, here's your homework. Don't trust the preacher. Amen. Amen. You say, what? Yeah, how many people have been led astray by trusting some Yahoo that's just spouting out a bunch of stuff? Listen, follow me as I follow Christ. Okay? You say, how can I tell if you're following Christ? It'll be lining up with the Bible. But the moment I don't follow Christ, don't follow me. That's good spiritual leadership right there. Follow me as I follow Christ. If everything I say should be backed up with what the word of God says. Amen. Now, watch what happened. This is why I'm telling you, go home and study your Bible. Don't just follow a man blindly. Amen. Follow God. Amen. By faith and check every man by the word of God. That's good preaching right there. Amen. Here's what it says in 2 Timothy 4 at the end of Paul's ministry, right before he's about to be killed by Nero. He's about to be cut off. This is at the spot where he says, listen, I've run the race. I've finished my course. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And uh, he says this. He says, only Luke is with me. 
In verse 10, he says, Demas has forsaken me. Listen, there's going to be some people that start the journey with you, but they're not going to continue with you. How many of you have had people leave you on your journey? Anybody have, have anybody leave them? And listen, people start off well, but not everybody finishes well. You be the kind of person that finishes well. You finish the race that God has set for you. Run with patience. It is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Be the kind of person that says, you know what? I've, I've run a good race like the Apostle Paul. Now, as Paul is finishing the end of his race, Demas is gone, having loved this present world. You say, why do people leave the faith? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. They get sidetracked by the things of this world. The devil uh, tempts them, and then their flesh is seduced, and then they go after it. And how many of you have ever been tempted by the devil and seduced into something wrong and found out that's not the right way? Yeah, all of us, right? Because all of us have flesh. But I got to tell you, Luke, the Bible says, even when Demas has forsaken Paul, who stayed with Paul? Luke. Luke was a good brother. Luke was Holy Spirit filled. And Luke, I want to tell you something. This is how he stayed so faithful. This just my thoughts. I believe he was a diligent student. I was, I believe he was the kind of guy that had a pen ready. Listen, Christians that come to church ready, actively engaged with notes, with a Bible, with a pen ready that are looking to apply the truth of God's wisdom to their life. I promise you those types of people will excel in their life. But Christians who sit back and do this, just feed me. I'm just going to be a, 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 a dumb sheep. <laughs> are you listening? You're not going to grow because you're expecting somebody else to spoon feed you your whole life. But somebody who engages their mind and says, I want to study. I want to show myself approved. Where does it say in the Bible? I want to know those type of people that are writing notes and are thinking, how do I connect this into my life so I can make changes in my life? I promise you those types of people, because they're hungering and thirsting for God's righteousness. They're growing every single day. They're looking to apply the truth into their life. They will excel. They will grow. The people who are, who are playing the victim, the people who are sitting back, the people who are, are looking for the easy street. I promise you, you ain't going to make it. Didn't he say that the, no, the road is narrow? The broad way leads to hell, but the narrow way leads to life. You say that what is the narrow way? How about the narrow way is a disciplined way? The narrow way is the way of the cross. The narrow way is, listen, not my way, his way. The narrow way is I'm going to deny myself, pick up my cross daily and follow him. How often am I supposed to die, deny myself, pick up my cross? Daily. 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 So it's not about just a one-time quick fix about, oh, I went to church once and I felt good. No, no. It's about it every day, whether I feel like it or I don't feel like it, I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to buy experience in every experience. Remember, experience is not the best teacher. Evaluated experience. Hey, some of us in here, we're going to have the same year as 2019 as this year because you're not writing notes and taking consideration on what went wrong last year and how to fix it. The, the choice is yours. I don't want to have the same year over and over. I want to have compounded growth. I want to grow deeper in the Bible this year. How about you? Anybody want to grow deeper in the Bible this year? Yes, the only way that's going to happen is if you reflect upon your experience and decide what it is that God wants to change in your life. Now, I can't do that for you. You've got to do that for you. But I promise you, as you apply yourself and you evaluate your experience and you make changes and adjustments, you will grow. You will grow. And Luke, by experience is writing this thing down and he, is, he, he has learned some things by painstaking effort. Now, in, in letter C, it, by order of events. Remember, the determination of Luke is to share what he's learned by the spirit, by experience, and by order of events. Look what it says in verse number three. It says, it seemed good to me also. Luke is saying, hey guys, hey, uh, he's saying to Theophilus, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. He's saying, I have taken the time, the diligent study, the effort to put this in order in a chronological format. Now, how many of you have written a book before? Anybody raise your hand if you wrote a book. Anybody write a book? Okay, so nobody here has written a book. Why? Why haven't you written a book? It's hard, right? It takes thought. It takes forethought, doesn't it, right? It takes organization. It takes discipline. It takes patience. It takes a lot of things. You're reading somebody who lived this, and he wrote out 24 chapters. And by the way, when he wrote it, there wasn't 24 chapters. It was just written out, right? They later on put those chapters in verses. Thank God for whoever did that. Amen? But he organized it out. 
And the way he did that is he did research. You know how to write a book? You do research. This is, I'm going to grab this, I'm going to grab this, I'm going to grab this. Now let's put it in order and let's make sure it's in bite-sized pieces. And here's what he did. He went around to Paul. Okay, tell me about this. How, when did the Sermon on the Mount? Tell me about, uh, what about that parable? How'd that parable go again? And oh, by the way, what did Jesus look like at the Mount of Transfiguration? And he would write notes, write notes. Then he would have taken all those papers and he would have been, okay, God empower me now. And he would have been, okay, now I'm going to set this in order in a very organized form and fashion so that by when I give it to you, it's easy to understand. It's crystal clear. You see that? That's what Luke is doing when he's writing this. Now he's writing it to a very specific person. Who is he writing it to? Theophilus. The name Theophilus means this, lover of God or friend of God. Theo is God. Phileo we know is, is friend or love, if you would. So he's writing to the friend of God or the lover of God. Question, are you a friend of God? Are you a lover of God? And so while he's writing it to a very specific person, God saw fit to take his writing, Luke's writing, and say, this is for all the friends of God. This is for all the lovers of God. And what Luke is doing here is he's saying, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding. Now, I told the 9 a.m. service how I studied. And I want to tell you how I study as well. Because here's the deal. Notice how when we first read these first four verses, it was kind of like, what is that talking about? Am I right? Yes, sir. It's like a lot of words don't understand what it means. What brings clarity to the fog is research and context. And so here's what I do. For example, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you one example. See the word perfect in verse number three? It seemed good to me also. Luke is saying it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding. So here's what I do. I asked myself the question when I was first reading this. What does he mean he has perfect understanding? Nobody has perfect understanding. What is he talking about, right? And so here's, here's what, I, what I do. When I'm looking up a word in the Bible, I go and I go to blueletterbible.com. And I'm going to look up the Strong's Concordance. I have an app on my phone. And I'm just going to type in under Strong's Concordance, under Blue Letter Bible, Luke chapter number one. And I'm teaching you what I do. Because understand, if I give you a fish, you're going to feed yourself today. But if I teach you how to fish tomorrow, later on tonight, when you're coming across a Bible passage, you can go investigate it and find out exactly how to get the answer without having to wait on your pastor or somebody else for the answer. Do you know how many times I'll get a text from somebody saying, what does this mean? And I'm happy with that, but listen, but here's what, I'm, what, what, I'd be, what I'd be even great, more grateful for, is if you take the tools that I give to you and you go get the answer for yourself. Amen? Amen. Why? Because now I'm teaching you how to fish. Instead of me spoon feeding you all the time, you're able to feed yourself. So that word under, uh, uh, under blueletterbible.org, Luke chapter 1, verse 3, it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding. Now the word perfect, every word in your Bible, has a corresponding Greek or Hebrew word. So the word perfect, it's, it's a G199. It's a Strong's number attached to that word perfect. Now, when, when you think of perfect, what do you think of? Absolute, you think of Jesus, you think of no, no sin, uh, you think of stuff like that, right? Now, when I click this button, G191, it's a Greek word. Now, remember, Luke's writing to Theophilus, the friend of God, saying, hey, I decided to write this because I have perfect understanding. Now, you want to know what that Greek word is? It's akribos. Now, listen. Strong's G199. Akribos. 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 Right? So, it's akribos. Say it with me. One, two, three. Akribos. Now, do more os. Okay, ready? Akribos. Now, use your hands a little. No, I'm just <laughs> now, this word in your Bible, this word in your Bible shows up five times. How many times does it show up in your Bible? Five. But it's not always translated perfect. The other place it's translated, it's translated diligently two times. It's translated perfect one time, it's translated perfectly one time, and it's translated circumspectly one time. So every time you see a, a, a word in your Bible, when you see it in English, sometimes in the Greek, it's a different word. It's the same word, but it's a different word in English. Does that make sense? So let me just change one thought here. Look in your Bible, verse 3. It seemed good to me also having diligent understanding. What does that do for you? 
See how it opens up the understanding a little bit? Here's what Luke is saying. I have diligent understanding through the circumspectual evidence that I have diligently sought out from multiple witnesses so that Theophilus, as I'm writing this to you, I want you to be crystal clear that I know the order and format in which all this th stuff went down. Can you see it now? So see how just one word can give you understanding? A little deeper understanding. Now you say, preacher, what if I, what if, okay, that's just one word. What if I want context? You say, preacher, I'm looking at, at, at Luke 1, 1 through 4, and I want to know, I, I don't know who Theophilus is. I don't know who Luke is. What do I do? I use Bible Gateway. It's an app on my phone, and I use Bible Gateway. So, like, for example, when you text me or call me and say, preacher, what does this mean? Here's what you're doing. Either, either I have it committed to memory, but by the, how many of y'all understand and can relate to this? As you get older, you forget stuff. Listen, I can watch the same movie like 100 times. I forget it. I really can and the same thing with the Bible. The stuff that I learned in Bible college, listen, I forgot all of it. Every time I study a new book, every time I preach a new sermon, guess what I got to do? I got to go right back and study the Greek, the Hebrew, and all the 10, 15, 20 different commentaries to get it, bam, right in my mind again. So right now, Luke 1, 1 through 4 is clear in my brain. But if you ask me next year what it's about, I may be a little foggy. I may have to do, go back right through the same thing again. Same thing, remember we did the book of Hebrews? I'd have to go back through the same thing again. The book of Romans, we did that. All the Colossians, all the other books. Listen, you always have to go back and refresh your brain on exactly the context of it. So you say, preacher, what if I'm on a Monday and I'm studying my Bible and I want to know, um, I'm reading something, I can't understand what it's talking about. How do I get that answer so I don't have to text you or call you? Does anybody want to know that? Yeah, you go to Blue Letter Bible or you can go to Bible Gateway uh, on, your, on your app and there's commentaries. You click the button, and guess what? You can look at Matthew Henry. You can look at all 10, 15, 20 different commentaries, and it's going to go Luke 1, 1 through 4. Theophilus is this. And it's going to say the book of Luke, written probably between 50, 60, or 70 A.D., right? And it's written to this man, and it's going to give you the full context. You say, preacher, why do we need you if we could just do it on our own? I'll tell you why. Because God has called me to preach the Word of God, and because you're lazy sometimes. <laughs> Amen. Because everybody likes to have somebody else do the work and just feed us, right? How many of y'all like to go out to eat for lunch? Yeah. Yes. How many? Not everybody likes to make all the food and do all the cleaning of the dishes and all that stuff. That's why sometimes as a pastor, when you don't come to church, it's a little disheartening because because Daddy went went ahead and uh, made up a good meal, Amen, and and uh, did everything he could to put together a good meal so that you can eat nicely, right? Are y'all following? And so. Here's what I want to do. Just because we don't always come to eat every every uh, every day, do we? So what about Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday when we're not in church? I want you to be able to feed yourself. I don't want to see y'all looking like a bunch of Somalis that haven't eaten in a long time or little Indian kids who haven't eaten for about six, seven days. Every time you come to church, going, feed me, preacher. I want you to be strong and healthy going, oh, yeah, I'm ready for this meal. I've been exercising, I've been taking care of this thing. I'm ready. Come on. Preacher's just going to give me a little extra on this thing. This is going to be a good meal. He's, and listen, preacher's a pro at this stuff. Listen, I'm an amateur, but preacher's a pro. And listen, he's going to really help us on this thing. And you all know there's a difference between an amateur and a pro. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes. You all know I get paid to do this, right? Yes. Come on. Yes. I get paid to do this. I do it for free, but I get paid to do this. Yeah. Y'all know that? There's a difference between an amateur cook and a, and a pro cook. And I got to tell you something. Luke, the guy's a pro. He's a pro doctor. He's a pro missionary. You look at him, he's a pro writer. I mean, the guy was meticulous and copious and diligent. And here's what he's saying. He's taking care of Theophilus. Here's what he's doing. He's taking Theophilus. You say, preacher, who's Theophilus? Well, let me give you, let me give you point number three, okay? Point number three. The devotion of Theophilus. The, the devotion of Theophilus. Now, Theophilus means lover of God or friend of God. Let me read verse number three and four again, okay? And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about Theophilus. Luke is saying, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, meaning the beginning of Christ all the way up till now, to write unto thee in order, chronologic if you would, most excellent Theophilus. Why is he calling him most excellent? Perhaps I'll tell you why. It's in the commentaries it says that Theophilus is, is a Roman official, a high-ranking Roman official. Hey, do you think it's important we reach our government leaders? 
I don't believe in separation of church and state for the for the purpose of keeping the church out of the uh, out of the state. I just believe in separation of church and state for keeping the state out of the church. Y'all following? I believe as Christians, it's our job to disciple those who are in government. Read your Bible. All the prophets, John the Baptist, they were preaching in the government. How many of y'all think that we need some good, strong spiritual leaders in our government? And listen, it's not just preaching. Get right, you people up in government. It's discipling those that are in government. It's praying with them. It's, it's going to the White House. It's going to the, the State House. It's, it's saying, let me teach you about Jesus Christ. Let me love you. Let me pray with you. Let me show you about the life of Christ. That is what Luke is doing with Theophilus. He's discipling him. We have a one-on-one -on -one discipleship course, don't we? And, and basically what we're doing is what Luke is doing for Theophilus. In the one-on-one -on -one continued discipleship is, is to teach them about Christ and the ministry of Christ inside the church and how we live for Christ. And so if you look here, he's saying, I wrote this unto the most excellent Theophilus. How's he treating him? With honor, with respect. Hey, you get a whole lot further when you treat people with love and kindness, don't you? Your disciples, those that you're working with, treat them with honor, treat them with dignity, treat them with, call, hey, most, it's so great to see you, most excellent Timothy, most excellent Carlo, oh, thou mighty woman, it's great to see you today. Hey, when you treat people that way, you know what happens to their ears? It opens them up. Listen, when they think you like them and you care about them, they're going to be a whole lot more inclined to, to want to receive your letter. But if they think you don't like them or you're thinking down upon them or you're looking badly upon them, when you write them a letter or a text or send them a note or want to call them, they'll be like, uh-uh. <laughs> going to go into self-preservation mode. But when they think, wow, thou man of God, honorable citizen, right upstanding member of the community, excellent warrior of the most high God, right? All of a sudden, woo, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Right. Let's open that thing. Let's open that message. So he says, I wrote it unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Now, here's why. Verse four, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. He's saying, listen, the reason I wrote this for you, I wrote you the whole life and ministry of Jesus Christ and a second volume of the book of Acts so that you might know what you've been instructed in. You see what he's doing is he's strengthening him in the truth. He's rooting him and grounding him in the truth of what he's believed. And so as you're taking notes, the devotion of Theophilus, A, a new believer. A new believer needs a mature believer to minister unto them, to disciple them, to love them, to pray with them, to care about them. Hey, are new believers going to be looking for leadership? Absolutely. They don't know the Bible. How many of y'all didn't know about the Greek uh, uh, corresponding word in, in the Strong's Concordance? Yeah. How many of y'all didn't know about the commentaries that you can go find and look up so that you can have all those references? How about this? How about the chain of uh, reference? You know, for every verse, like, for example, if we were looking up Luke 1, 4, inside your Bibles, how many have a Bible where there's a chain of references, meaning there's a concordance right there that gives you like three or four verses tied to that verse? Raise your hand if you have one of those. Okay. Now, how many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? Okay. So if you, okay, so here's what I did. In my studies as a believer, I'm just trying to help you because I, I, I don't want to just give you a fish. I want to teach you how to fish. Because if you become an excellent fisherman of the word of God, not only can you help yourself and feed your family, but you can disciple many, many other people. Here's what I did. When I first got saved, I was so hungry for the truth. I, got, I had cross-references in the middle of my Bible. And here's what I would do. I would look at the verse, and if there was a verse next to it that said, go look at this, I would search it. If there's three or four of them, I'd find it. I'd search every one. Then I'd have my pen and my highlighter handy. I'd be like, oh, yes. And, and here's what my, my brain started doing. My brain started connecting the dots to everything. Before you know it, the whole thing started coming together. Then I found out, you know what? Let me see how I can do it on my own. After, after several years of reading all the commentaries and reading all the chain of references, I thought, you know what? Let me see how far my advancement has come. And this is after hours and hours. And I'd be up until 2 or 3 in the morning, and, and the Bible would just be coming alive, and just this insatiable, insatiable thirst would come upon me. Then I thought, you know what? I don't want to look at anybody else's thoughts. I just want to see how far I've come. And I'd get a whole new Bible. You know how many Bibles I got? I got a bunch of Bibles. And every, I got this Bible uh, two months ago. I already read through it, and I'm reading through it a second time. You look at this Bible, there's notes all over it. It's highlighted, circled, cross-references, uh, connecting words to other words. Why? Because I want my mind to open up. I want to know the full counsel of God. I want to know God better. 
And so what I'd do is I'd say, okay, no more commentaries, no more chain references. Let me see if I can create my own chain references. And so what I'd do is I'd read a verse, and, and then other passages would flip into my mind. I'd go, ooh, yeah, where's that at? And my mind would go, oh, there it is. And I'd create my own chain references. Before you know it, it's like a glove. You know, it just fits perfectly. Now when people talk, it doesn't matter what you say. I know the verses are flowing through my brain, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm becoming one in the spirit with God and thinking through all that stuff. Now, like I told you before, the brain can forget things. So just because you got to a certain pinnacle of spiritual sensitivity, are you all following now? If you sin once, if you get in the flesh once, come on, how many of y'all know what I'm talking about? You start getting proud. You start getting a little arrogant. What happens is your heart goes cold to the word of God. And all that unction that you built up, all that clarity, all that systematic theology, it starts to get a little foggy. Before you know it, you're not as clear. And I don't know about you, but I strive to make sure I don't get foggy like that. But the only way that can happen is if I stay steady in the Bible. And so new believers out there, it's your job to thirst and hunger for the word of righteousness. Amen. Go home and study it. Get in there. Devour that thing. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to be filled every single day. And when you come to church, you'll be like, yes, yes, I like this a lot. And you're going to write notes. Like, for example, when I throw out those cross-references, 2 Timothy chapter 4, Colossians, I tell you Colossians chapter 4 and Philemon 24, that's like throwing meat to like carnivores. You know what I mean? My pastor, he'd throw out stuff. I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm going to find that right. And I'd have such a hard time just holding back, not going to look at it right away because I want to see it right now. But I would be so intense with my Bible reading that I'd write the notes. And then, and then later on, if there was something that my pastor was preaching on uh, that day, if my mind was foggy or was unclear on it, in the afternoon, I'd go eat lunch on Sunday, and then I'd be like, oh, you know what? I haven't read the book of Esther. He just started reading that. I can't remember. Or what about the book of Ruth? Or he mentioned Ezekiel 38, 39, Gog and Magog. I saw that on the internet. What's happening in China and Russia? What does it say in the Bible? What about the book of Revelation chapter number 17? And so my mind would go, oh, go back in. Go back in and study it. And here's what I would do. As a growing believer, I would go and do all my homework. And that's what you should do too. Now listen, all of us grow at different paces. But all of us should be equally hungry for the word of God. Amen. So Theophilus, he was a new believer. B, he was a prominent believer. He was a prominent believer. Probably a well-educated Roman government official. And so he's been treated with dignity and respect. C, he's a growing believer. A growing believer. Many people believe this. That Theophilus may have sponsored the work of Luke meaning he may have funded the writing of this gospel. Now, I didn't know this until I started researching a little bit more, but it, it, it could be a possibility. Now, listen, you say, what, is that, what does that mean? That means this. Here's what I take from that. As a growing believer, I invest into my growth. How many of y'all invest into your growth? And I promise you, the people that invest into their growth in here will be growing people. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Anybody who's looking for a free ride, listen, God's grace is is free and it's given to all. But I promise you this. If you don't learn how to invest into your growth, you won't go up any further. Buy the truth and sell it not. Think about this. You want education? You You won't value what you don't pay for. Am I right? If you're always getting a free meal, then guess what? Eventually, you're going to start feeling a little guilty because you're not adding any value into the game. You're just being a taker. Am I right? But the moment you start investing into your growth, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. When you invest into your house, will you take care of your house a little bit better? When you invest into your church, will you take care of your church a little better? When you invest into things, here's what happens. Because your heart follows your treasure when you invest into it. If I buy a piece of house, I buy a house or I buy a stock. Let's say you invest into a stock. Where do you think your eyes are going to check after you invest into that stock? You're going to be watching the little ticker. What's the little sign on that ticker? How's my investment doing? See, Many of us, we think that growth is just going to happen automatically. It's not. The only way that we grow is is by personal investment of time, energy, and wisdom. Many people believe that Theophilus, as a hungering and thirsting uh, disciple, may have sponsored Luke in writing, if you would, Luke and Acts so that he could understand. Let me ask you this question. When's the last time you invested into buying a book, into buying a Bible, into buying a journal? into buying something so that you can personally grow. Now, if you get it for free, listen, if I gave you a book, I can give out books all day long. But there's just something different when you spend money that you worked for 
that you say, no, I spent money on that. I'm going to get my money's worth. Have you ever gone to a buffet before? You know what I'm talking about? You're like, nah, I spent $27 on this meal. You better believe I'm going back for four or five plates. I'm getting my money's worth out of this. The same thing happens with your spiritual investment. Listen, I've spent thousands. I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on my own personal growth. I've been all over the world. I've been and met with some of the greatest leaders, and I've spent lots and lots of money. Why? Because I understand this. Unless I invest into my growth, I'm not going to grow. You've got to get under the spout where the glory falls out. And, and if that means I've got to spend some money to get there, I'm going to spend some money to get there because I'm going to be a changed person out of the value. Because it's not the money. It's the value that I'm going to get in exchange for that money. You all following? Growing believers, they invest into their growth. Hey, Theophilus is growing. Luke is, is growing. They're all growing here. And let me give you letter D. He's a generous believer. A generous believer. I believe this. The Christians that are growing the most in this congregation are the generous ones. Did you hear that? Those who learn to sow the seeds of success will reap the harvest of prosperity. But those that hold back and are stingy and don't want to invest and are looking for an easy way, they're not going to go very far. Remember what the Bible says. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. How many of y'all want to grow big time this year? Anybody out there want to grow big time? Man, I want to grow big time this year. I understand this, that if we're going to grow big time, we've got to be generous believers. In conclusion, we see here these four verses. Now, let, 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 let me give you these notes. The declaration of Christ. The declaration of Christ, do you believe? The determination of Luke. Oh, man, he was, he was determined to share by experience and by the Spirit and by order. And the devotion of Theophilus. Now, let me read these four, these four verses. Let me give you those, those words again for your notes so you have them. The declaration of Christ, the determination of Luke, and the devotion of Theophilus. Now, Remember what I told you at the beginning of this message. I would finish this message and read these four verses and you would have crystal clear understanding on what it means, right? Let's read it again and see if the message hit the target and your eyes are open and you understand exactly what's happening here. Ready? Luke 1.1. 1, 1. For as much as, as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things, wherein thou hast been instructed. Is it crystal clear? Is it clear? I can't hear you. Is it clear? I did my job. Amen. And that is what the pastor's job is. Amen. To feed the flock, to give clarity, to give the tools. And now my encouragement to you is this. We've started the first four verses of the Gospel of Luke. Will you take the journey together with me through the whole book? Every Sunday we'll be here. And let's take the journey and let's learn expositionally, verse by verse. And let's be instructed in what God has given to us. Amen.